Chelsea. Not John Healy. <laughs> <laughs> I beg the honourable gentleman's pardon. Pete Wishart. Deputy Speaker, I am grateful. So, so, this is what an English Parliament looks like. It looks pretty much like the unitary UK Parliament to me. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a remarkable day. And I think, I think it's worth noting, I think it's worth noting just the, his, the significance how historical this is. Because for the first time in the history of this House, of this Parliament, members of Parliament will be banned from participating in divisions of this House based on nationality and geographic location of constituency. Member. The Honourable Member's uh, constituents in Perth and North Perthshire, who may well have voted for him, surely see this as a very fair motion to safeguard the United Kingdom yeah. by having a fair The Honourable Gentleman tempts me, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'll just say to him a couple of things. One thing, I was elected on the same basis as the Honourable Gentleman, where my constituents expect me to participate in all debates and all legislation in this House. I am now denied that. I am now denied that. The second thing I'd say to the Honourable Gentleman, if he thinks that going down such a route as this, where Scottish members of Parliament are banned from voting on certain issues considered English only, is going to save his union, he is going to have another exactly. thought coming. Because Absolutely. nothing, exactly. nothing, Madam Deputy Speaker, has infuriated the Scottish people more than the measures around English votes for English laws. And how can I resist the honourable gentleman? Well, well, can, can he just tell me, if he's such a passionate believer in us settling everything together, why I'm not even allowed to express a view, let alone a vote, on local government, health and education in his constituency? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Honourable Gentleman just does not understand, and I'll try and explain to him patiently once again. We live in the United Kingdom. There is asymmetric devolution within the United Kingdom. We have a parliament in Scotland that determines and decides the very issues. Order. The Honourable Gentleman is a member of this House. He has a right to be heard. He will be heard. Pete Wishart. If I, came in, I didn't know if I was a member of this House or an international observer, but I'll, I'll take the initial one as your favour. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. But can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, we have a Parliament in Scotland that determines and decides these things. And he's right, we do that in Scotland. We do these things in this House too. But what the Honourable Gentleman wants and what has been created today is a quasi-English Parliament within the confines of the unitary Parliament of United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And that, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, is the nub of the issue. And that is why this is so significant, so remarkable here today. The first meeting. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman, of course. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. May I remind him that what we have before us today is a consent mechanism. And that's for members from England or England and Wales to agree to measures that apply only with us. At third reading, if there is something in the bill that he fundamentally disagrees with, he will have a vote to vote against it. Yes. Can I tell the Honourable Gentleman what it feels like to us? What it feels like to me and my Honourable Friends and Right Honourable Friends is that we are on the wrong side of a banishment, of a bar, which denies us are the right and our right as legitimately elected members of Parliament from participating fully in this House here today. That is what's been done. And this is the key of the issue, Madam Deputy Speaker. They still fail to grasp this. What they have done today through the creation of this Legislative Grand Committee is create two members of Parliament in this House. That is the thing that we object to. That is the issue that is so difficult for us. And I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful, Madam Chairman, to the Honourable Gentleman uh, giving way. Whilst this side of the House uh, finds its handkerchiefs to mop its tears, um, <laughs> could I just ask the Honourable Gentleman why it is that if he and his party feel so passionately about this bill, why there were no votes from the SNP members on either the second reading or at report stage? Yeah. 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 Can, can I say to the, to the Honourable Gentleman, we haven't got any great in interest in this particular oh. bill. <laughs> 
deserve the right to have an incest. I, I don't know. I don't know why that comes as a surprise to the honourable gentleman. And I'll say it again to him, just in case he missed it over all that. We have no great interest in this particular bill of legislation. And the honourable gentleman is right. He's right. The honourable gentleman is absolutely right. We did not vote in second reading. We did not vote in any of the proceedings that we were allowed to participate in because we actually respect the right of English members of Parliament to determine issues on this basis. Of course, that's the right, and that's why we took no interest. I'm not giving away again. I'm answering the, the mem honourable member's point. That is why we stayed away in these particular divisions. But what this piece of legislation did does. What the creation of this Legislative Grand Committee does, and again, I'm astounded that honourable members opposite just do not understand or get this. What you have done, what honourable members have done, is create two classes of members of Parliament of this House. There is one class that is able and has the ability to participate in every division in this House, as we're about to see, and there's other members of Parliament, like my honourable friends behind me, who are not able to participate at all parts of legislation. That's what the honourable members have done. There are far too many of them, so I'll just say no to them all. This is what they have done. Even if I wanted to have a say in this legislation, I would be barred from doing so. I'm not allowed to vote on this. I'm not even allowed to call a division, Madam Deputy Speaker. On this. If I attempted to call a division, you would quite rightly rule me out of order according to the standards of this House. Now, if I was to actually vote in this division, I've got no idea what would happen. I'm presuming that Sergeant Arms would come chasing after me with his little sword, telling me I cannot participate in this vote and chase me out of the... And that's what he should do. And that's what the Sergeant Arms' job would be. I'll give it to the Honourable Lady, because I like her. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and he'll know I have a great deal of respect for him. But he is, he's talked about how this feels for him and his colleagues. Can I say to him how it has felt for my constituents in South Devon? And that is that a historic injustice has been righted uh, today. And I would just put that to him, that they feel that they have been underrepresented. And it is about our constituents, not about ourselves, that we care in this house. Here's something for the Honourable Lady, who I obviously have much respect for, to, to consider. How about this? How about if we all retain an equality in this House? We, we all have the same rights and privileges within this House of Commons, like we did just up to a, a few short weeks ago. And the Honourable Lady and all her friends, who obviously feel very strongly about this, and I understand the passion that's engendered about this issue from English members of Parliament, how about they create a Parliament? How about designing a Parliament yeah, yeah, yeah. in your own image? where you could look after these issues, like we do in the Scottish Parliament. Why don't you have a Parliament that sits not necessarily in this House, maybe in one of your other great cities throughout the United Kingdom, where democracy could be seen in action? How about that as a solution? And then we come back together in this House as equal members and consider the great reserved issues of foreign affairs, of defence, of international relationship. Now, that is how most other nations do it. It's called federalism, and it seems to work quite adequately in most other nations. What what these honourable members have done today is create this absolute mess, burr, guddle, that nobody even understands how it particularly works. We have just, Madam Deputy Speaker, called division bells to suspend the proceedings of this House while the Speaker could scurry off and, and consult with the clerks of this House in order to recertify and see if it's necessary to recertify certain pieces of legislation. This is what has happened to the business of this, this great Parliament within the whole of the European Union. This is what we've resorted to today. And I give way to the, the Honourable Fred again. Who I like very much. I am very grateful for the honourable gentleman giving way, but I think he has actually got it fundamentally wrong yeah. that two tiers of members of Parliament have not been created by the mechanism that has been used. By using standing orders, which can be changed by all members of Parliament, and by this being a grand committee, not and we see where the mace is, not the House sitting in full session. The rights of every individual member remain intact, and that is crucially important. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, and on all candour, it's not what it feels like here. It's not what it feels like in this side. What, what we're observing, and what we're actually going to experience later on, if a division is called, is that he will be able to vote in that division. He will be able to express his view as a legitimately elected member of Parliament, Myself and my honourable friends, as equally legitimate members of Parliament, recently elected at the last general election, will not be allowed to vote. We will be banned, we will be barred, we will be effectively banished from that, that process. I'll give way to the honourable lady. Would the honourable gentleman really 
expect that the taxpayers of this country are supposed to pay for this other parliament that he wishes to suggest to create simply because his feelings are somehow assaulted? I don't know how he could explain that extra layer of bureaucracy and cost to the British taxpayer, but maybe that's how they like to do it in Scotland and spend other people's money. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm grateful or not to the Honourable Lady for her intervention from that. What I think she's sort of saying is that she wants some cake and wants great dollops of it so she can spend her time eating it. And that is to have a singularly English Parliament and it's just, let's just use the House of Commons to accommodate that. And this is the thing that's been created here, this quasi-English Parliament within the... Con now, this Parliament belongs to me as much as her. It belongs to the Scottish people as much as the English people. But what has happened today and what is happening with this Legislative Grand Committee is that she will be able to represent her constituents with all the visions of the House. I will not, my honourable friends. Will. That is what's been created. I'll give way to my lobby neighbour. Extremely grateful. I think what the House will read from the honourable gentleman's animated, passionate and as ever fluent speech is the fact he's furious about a typically British evolution in the system of government, which means that it which blocks his devoutest desire, which of course is separation for Scotland. This is a system that makes it fair in England. It, 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 it deals with that grievance and it means that his hope of independence disappears. That's why he's so angry. With, with so many things from the honourable gentleman, he's half right. This has been noted in Scotland. There's lots of people actually observing this just now. What they're seeing, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this parliament becoming, an, in effect, an English parliament. They're seeing the voices of their members of parliament, that they're just so recently elected, being diminished within this house, where they will not be able to speak and be, vote in particular lobbies. Now, I listened to the leader of the house during the evil debates. I listened to the Leader of the House and the impression the Leader of the House gave throughout all of the, co all the conversations and discussions and debates we had about English votes for English laws would that be all these sort of votes would be subject to a double majority. That there would be the vote of the whole House and, and that would express its will. Then there would be a vote from English members of Parliament and that would effectively be their veto. Now, that hasn't happened. What's happened is that there has been a banishment in, in this. There, there has been a bar. Now, this is the brutal reality of English votes for English laws. This is what happens when we start mucking about with the standing orders and arrangements and membership issues of this <coughs> House. What we are left with is a series of members of Parliament who could do anything, could participate, could vote on any issue, and other members who are not. And it is totally unsatisfactory. Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, we've just, we've just wasted God knows how much time discussing is these issues here today. It has made such a mess to the parliamentary proceedings of this House. Extra aspects and elements and additions put onto a hard-working House when it's considering bills. It is a total mess. Yes, of course, John, giving way. He's already told the House that the Scottish Nationalist Party has no interest. <laughs> Scottish National Party has no interest in this measure, which in no way applies to Scotland, and therefore will not vote on the matter. So, what's his problem? They have every right to speak in this, and now we have redressed an injustice whereby we on these benches have felt for years the second class citizens while we have been unable to vote on matters of health and education in Scotland and they have been able to vote on matters solely to do with England. And will the honourable gentleman tell us this? On the hunting measure that was proposed to bring hunting regulations in England and Wales into line with those in Scotland, will the Scottish National Party have voted on that one? Can I say this to the Honourable Gentleman, all ca in, in, all, in all candour, and, and another Member of Parliament who I very much respect, it's, it, and it's, it's, it's this. We hear so much from our English colleagues about the deeply held views that they have about English votes for English laws. And again, the Honourable Gentleman is a fine exponent of that, the injustice. How dare these Scots oppress all these English members who only make up something like 85% of this House, coming down here, stealing their votes and ensuring that we take a say in the legislation down here. In fact, if I look around the chamber here to the Conservative majority that we have, 88% of this House is English only. And that we are the, the reasons why they cannot get their way. It is a ridiculous <laughs> argument. It is a ridiculous assumption. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't want to take up any more of this time because we're going to come back to these. I can if they want. We will be coming back to this. We will be coming 
come back to these issues in the future. This is not concluded. Now, they'll think, and I've heard again several English members say this today, that they're doing this to save the union. Well, can I just add a word of caution to my friends who represent English constituencies? What you are doing today by establishing this committee and pursuing this issue in the way that you have, you are driving Scotland out of the door. This is how it is being observed in Scotland. What we heard during the referendum, Madam Deputy Speaker, and you will remember this, stay with us, Scotland. Scotland, we love you. The minute we park our backsides on these green benches, we're diminished in status and not allowed to have a Would say in all this. Yes, of course, I can wait on that. As someone who represents proudly an English constituency, I feel today, and I don't know if my other colleagues on the Labour benches feel the same, that the Tories are making precisely the same mistake as, a, as their predecessors did over Ireland. Self-restraint is the way in which Scottish members and Welsh members can decide that an issue should not be one they should vote on. To try and have second and second, first and second class members does a disservice to the Union of Great Britain, of the United Kingdom, and I deplore what is being done. And, and I'm very, very grateful to the honourable gentleman. And I knew when I gave way to him that we would be hearing one of the quality interventions of this debate. Today. And he is absolutely and utterly right in what he says. The only thing I'll say to the honourable gentleman, where on earth is his front bench? They're not even prepared to make any sort of speech or statement today about this. Why are they not participating in something like this? Now, the Labour Party used to be stalwarts in this debate. But I remember when we had 50-odd Labour members of Parliament from Scotland in this debate. They would be making a fuss. They would be standing up for Scotland's interests. Absolute and utter silence from the Labour benches today. Now, I don't know... Could the Honourable Gentleman give way? Yes, of course, I'll give way. How could I not? I'm delighted the Honourable Gentleman's giving way because non-SNP Scottish members of Parliament in this chamber have participated in this bill all the way through. And we see this process as being a complete charade as well and agree with them. But whilst I was voting at 2.45am on behalf of my constituents, the member from Perth and North Perthshire was in his bed. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, <laughs> it is with great fascination that we hear from the one and only Scottish Labour Member of Parliament. And maybe that's the reason that the Honourable Gentleman is in such a diminished position. Their silence on these issues, the way that they have ignored it all the way through, Madam Deputy Speaker, speaks volumes about the attitude of the Labour Party. And I don't know if it's all to do with the particular chaos just now, but that we need to hear from Labour about what they have and what's happened today. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll conclude. They thought, they thought, the the oh, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady, of course. Somebody, thank you, the Honourable Member, for giving way. As somebody who was here in the wee small hours, um, Labour were actually, the Labour Party were actually notable from their absence, um, being far too busy clawing their own eyes out at the time. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. a, a bit of a, a treat to come and lecture us here. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady, who does remind us that was the night of the long reshuffle. So I was grateful that the hon Honourable friends from the Labour Party were there. Madam the Speaker, I don't want to take up any more of the time of the House. No, you're not getting that one. All I would say, Madam Deputy Speaker, if they think this is saving their union. Oh, sorry, before I do conclude, of course, can we. Thank you. We, um, thank you again, uh, Madam Chairman. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for allowing me to intervene. Uh, since the front bench uh, has boasted, and uh, it was a boast, that this is a historic occasion, perhaps it would help if this occasion were not flawed by the fact that, for example, I'm just taking one example, but new clause 62 is designated as applying exclusively to England. And perhaps the minister would just turn quickly before we proceed to new clause 62 and see whether it applies not only to England, but I think the words wheels apply and are in the clause. The Honourable Lady, we've made a very creative intervention in order to put our point direct to the Minister, which I think <coughs> deserves a response. But all I can say from our perspective of this, the Honourable Lady, is that we're going to see lots of issues like this. The, the, the rulings of evil and to be confined to a grand committee such as this is that no consequential issues are to be considered by the Speaker in order to make these certifications. That means there will be massive issues which will impact on my constituents down the line and I will not be able to represent my constituents in these things. If they think they've won 
And if they think they believe that this is going to have anything other than a total detrimental impact for the fortunes of the Conservative Party of Scotland, they're going to have to have another think about this. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is unworkable. This is a guddle. This is a mess. This is unfair. This creates two classes of members of Parliament in this House, and this is totally unacceptable to the Scottish National Party and to my honourable friends. John Ruff.